Ladies and gentlemen, the power of the voice. Um, just before we start, you may have noticed just a tiny bit of infrastructure around you. Um, this is because this is being live streamed, so big smiles and everyone's got makeup on, haven't you? <laughs> Now, we're very excited about this evening. In fact, we're very excited about the rest of the year. This is a woman that is worthy of being celebrated. And to kick things off, I'd like to introduce you to the Chief Executive of the National Capital Authority, who is also a woman worth celebrating. Ladies and gentlemen, Sally Barnes. Give that woman a pay rise, I say. <laughs> So, hello, lovely to see you all here. Last time, how's that? Last time we tried to have an event like this, we were doing a community forum dated the 24th of March, 2020. And that, so it's lovely to see faces here, familiar faces and new faces. Um, can I start by Dawa Nuna, Dawa Ngunnawal. We're on Ngunnawal land. And tonight, with our esteemed guests and with all of you here, we're going to look at a slither of history. But what we can't forget is that slither is within the quantum of tens and thousands of years for the Ngunnawal people, who for all that time have raised their families here, had ceremonies and celebrations. So we continue that tradition. I'd formally like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging and to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here today in the audience. So, as Ros said, tonight's event is part of a big year for us, or a big six months, a rolling program to celebrate that woman, Marion, the magic of Marion. Um, and as well as welcome you all here on Know More Country, can I say welcome and hello to all the people watching out in live stream land. This event was sold out, so we decided to live stream it. We have never done this before. We have never had all of this equipment here before. And I don't know who's watching, but I hope you've settled back, have a nice drink, something to eat, because we've all, people who wanted wine here have got it before we started. Um, six months worth of programming for Marion couldn't be possible without event partners. So we've had all the cultural institutions huddling for a few months to bring out their inner Marion. So what we've promoted so far for February and March is just a tiny bit of what's coming. The National Library is bringing things out of their treasures exhibition. Um, the National Gallery of Australia is bringing things out of their vault around Marion as well as part of their Know Their Name program. The National Museum of Australia has got a, a talk on in March. So keep watching. There'll be lots and lots and lots of Marion things happening. So why Marion? And is it Marnie or Mahoney? I'm a Mahoney person. Yep. Yep. Hand up for the Mahoneys. Thank you. Hand up for the Marnies. Rosborough. <laughs> so apparently Mahoney is, when I went to the US on a tour that, and learned a lot about her and her work with Frank Lloyd Wright, it was definitely Marion Mahoney Griffin. I came back here, started working for the NCA. And this is my third anniversary today. And Ros has been spending three years trying to knock Mahoney out of me and put me on to Marnie, but I'm sticking to Mahoney. Anyway, 150 years seems to be a perfect reason to celebrate Marion. But it's also a time that we make space for women, that we make space for women in the national capital, and we talk about women who have contributed to our nation. More often than not, they get written out of history, they just get forgotten. Marion's not quite forgotten, but there are many other women involved with the Constitution, involved with a whole citizenship and a whole range of other things, people, women, who we might know about or we might not know about. This morning I met with Claire and Kim Rubenstein from the um, University of Canberra talking about their 50-50 women program. And I was embarrassed because a lot of women they mentioned and I thought I knew quite a bit about women in history, but I'm not as an esteemed historian, and I'm not a historian, but... So we have to start talking about those hidden figures. And Marion, as I say, wasn't hidden, but this is a good excuse to actually bring her out and bring her out on her own. Um, for those of you who've been here before, and there are lots of familiar faces, so I know you've been here before, you might notice there's something different over there where it says the magic of Marion. 
Usually she's got Walter sort of standing beside her. And while we love Walter, and we love Walter, trust us, we thought for six months it was worthy having Marion by herself and allowing young men, young women, old men, old women, to have a little conversation with Marion. She's at your height. In fact, she's shorter than I am, but she's at some people's height, so you can have a little chat to her and please take a selfie with her after the event and post it. I don't know how to do that, but Eleanor in the red jacket <laughs> will help you. So Walter and Marion didn't just win a design competition, they laid the unique plans for this city. They, 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 in their plans was the ethos for not just a city but a national capital and a capital that spoke to the rest of the world about Australia, this newly formed country. Um, as I said, people who've been here before know that we're pretty obsessed with telling the story of Canberra. The exhibition here is the story of Canberra and why, why here and how it got to, to um, be in place. We got to meet Marion only because she was involved in that competition. And the need for the new capital, of course, came from the Federation and a new country. And it also came out of one of my favourite processes and my fa one of my favourite books, The Australian Constitution. The bit I love the most, I'm not going to read it all to you. <laughs> section 50. <laughs> Just a minute, what's section 50? No, I'm going to read you section 125, seat of government, under the miscellaneous section. The seat of government of the Commonwealth shall be determined by the Parliament and shall be within territory which shall, shall have been granted or acquired by the Commonwealth and shall be vested in and belong to the Commonwealth and shall be in the state of New South Wales and be distant no less than 100 miles from Sydney. So all of this started when we decided to become a, feder a country, a federation. So we've got two experts in their field tonight who are going to take us from what it was like at the time of this document, what was the mood of the nation, what was the world like for women, and that's Claire. Thank you very much. And then we've got Glenda who's going to take us into, so what's, what was Marion like? Where was she born? What were the influences? Um, but as I said, can I remind you that we're a COVID safe event? So I've been told to tell you to stay in your seats Keep your hands to yourself. <laughs> Although you seem like a fairly well-behaved group and I probably didn't have to tell you that. Um, there are water bottles at the front if you need a drink and you, once you've touched one, you've got to keep it. And Ros has always already told you in case of an emergency, just follow her because she, she knows what she's doing. Even if she doesn't know how to pronounce Marion's name correctly. <laughs> so sit back and relax and I'll ask Claire to start the evening off for us. As a bit of background, Claire Wright is an historian, author and broadcaster. She's a professor of history at La Trobe University and was the winner of the 2014 Stella Prize. And you can tell them about the film. I won't mention the film. Claire's also been awarded an Order of Australia. Claire's book, You Daughters of Freedom, brings to life the first couple of decades of the 20th century of Australia. Talks about people who were significant in making it happen, talks about women who were significant in making it happen, and gives us a sense of the feeling of the time, what the nation was looking for at this time. So Claire, I'm gonna hand over to you to set the scene. Take us back to those heady days of Federation. Thanks so much, Sally. Just adjust that because I'm about as short as Marion is, even in heels. My talking shoes, as my daughter calls them. I too would like to acknowledge that I am privileged to be here on Ngunnawal country and acknowledge elders past and present. This is unceded, sovereign, stolen land and it is a privilege for all of us to be here today. I'd also like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations of Melbourne, where I live and work, for the rights that they give me to be on country. I'm very lucky to be in Canberra here this week. Um, I've been here all week doing research for my next book. And when Sally realised that I was here, she asked me whether I would come along and, and just say a few words to you tonight to, as she said, introduce this particular period of history. And I guess the reason for that is to ask the question, 
Was Marion Marnie Griffin, I'm going to say Marnie, was Marion Marnie Griffin a woman ahead of her time? And to answer that question, we need to know something about that time. So I want to take you back then. I want to take you back to this Federation era. And I want to take you back to the moment where the people of Sydney are commemorating that first birthday. Have we got that first image? I'm hoping this works. As I said, this is a bit quick and dirty putting things together. And that's not it. So we're going to stand on the shores and there we go. There's something. And we've got a few little images around it, but you get the general idea. We're standing on the shores, we're looking off to a distant horizon, and what we can see, there we go, we got there. What we can see on that distant horizon is this great moment of enlightenment. The sun rising on a new day, in fact, a new century. And this is the dawn of a new nation. The Federation of the Colonies of the Commonwealth. There was room for New Zealand to join, but they decided not to. They let it lapse and they let it stay open. There you go. There, there was, uh, it was a chance in 1891 that New Zealand was going to become one of those colonies, uh, one of the Federation, but they uh, chose to let that offer go. But here we are, standing on the shores. We're looking up to the horizon. The Commonwealth, 1901. Um, we have this maiden woman here um, who represents hope and innocence and uh, a sense of uh, prosperity. There's all of the shields of the colonies, now states, down there. And, and here, this is the government of New South Wales. This is their official program. And this image really says it all, because this is the sense of optimism that this new nation wanted to project to the world. This sense of outward looking, this sense of bringing in a new time, a new era. And Australia was incredibly self-conscious about itself as being a leading force, a light bringer to the world. There was the old world, which was dark, and it was full of oppression and hierarchy and, and problems that were to be addressed and had not been addressed through the 19th century. And here was Australia standing on the precipice and it had this extraordinary feeling of capacity. And this is why, this is one of the reasons why Walter Burley Griffin decided to apply for the prize to design Canberra because he called this a country of bold Democrats. And in fact, Australia was the most democratically advanced country in the world. And this is the reason, this is for the source of pride. And to understand that, we have to understand the position of women in this country. Because Australia led the world in women's suffrage. One of those intractable problems that needed to be solved, what Kevin Rudd might have called the great moral problem of our age, which is what he called climate change before he changed his mind, that great moral problem of the age, that was what was known as the woman question. The woman question was the fact that women all over the world were demanding their rights. They were demanding their citizenship rights. They were demanding the franchise, the right to vote, the right to be counted in the nations that they came from. And this is a worldwide global phenomenon. And Australia was the first country to find a solution to this problem. Because Australia, in that beautiful little document that Sally handed before, the Constitution, embedded effectively the right of women, not only to vote, but to stand for parliament. So New Zealand women had won the right to vote in 1893. 
But in 1894, South Australian women won the right to vote and the right to stand for parliament, including Indigenous women. And that right was guaranteed in 1902 in the Franchise Act. And there's a long process that that happened, but basically many women gathered together to make sure that South Australia's uh, standard of franchise became the national standard. And one of those women was Catherine Helen Spence. She was the woman we were discussing this morning. Um, and she is really the woman who should stand in conversation with um, that statue of Andrew Inglis Clark that you'll now find on Commonwealth Avenue because they worked together. In fact, the Hare-Clark system used to be known as the Hare-Spence system around the world globally. She was much more known for her democratic reform movements, which Clark eagerly took up. Um, and unfortunately, and this is one of the stories that we're telling here today, his name has been remembered and he's immortalised in that enormous statue and Catherine Helen Spence has been largely forgotten. But the world looked to Australia. So this process of Australia looking out at the world was mirrored by the fact that the world was looking at Australia. It was looking at this independent, bold, democratic nation that had courageously, it was seen, found a solution to this problem. And the whole world was watching to see what this, the results of this grand experiment were going to be. Was the sky going to fall in the way that all the anti-suffrage campaigners were um, anticipating and arguing against? Was, were the doomsayers going to be proven right? Was this going to be the end of the family? Would women stop marrying? Would they stop having children because they had to spend all that time going to the ballot box? These were the sort of things that were honestly debated. Would they become unsexed? Would they um, uh, suddenly lose all their feminine charms and graces? The, this is the sort of thing that, um, that the world debated and here was Australia, the light bearer. Now I want to make a, 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 a point about that idea of light bearing um, and this new dawn, this enlightenment, because there's a racialized aspect to that too. Australia was a light bringing nation, it was also a white nation. So the first piece, that, that um, Franchise Act that Australia brought in, that, that enshrined those democratic rights that it became globally renowned for. That was the second piece of legislation passed. The first piece of legislation passed was the White Australia policy. Well, what became that? The Immigration Restriction Act. So let's be very clear that Australia was a nation that was proudly British, it was proudly white, it intended to keep things that way. So was Marion a woman ahead of her time? Well, she was very much of this moment. So she, she was part of this global movement that was trying to change the conditions of women's lives. She was an active suffrage campaigner herself. And I want to look at one year in particular. Sorry, Sally's asked me to talk to 10 minutes and that's a bit like um, uh, stopping the clock on climate change or something. No, no, we can do better than that and I will wrap up soon. But I want to look at this year 1911. It's a very important year that I think kind of coalesces some of these ideas. So this is the year that Marion and Walter were married. That's the first point about this year and Glenda will probably say more than that. It's also the, the year that they were awarded the contract to design Canberra. Oh, sorry, they were awarded that in 1912. This is the year they were working on that together before they came to Australia. It's also the year of enormous amount of suffrage campaigning and movement in Britain. Can we look at the second slide for one second, please? So I want to show you this image here um, because this is an image that comes from the suffrage et campaign in London. Um, this is Dame Partington sweeping away all of the dregs of the old world. Um, and um, and she's, this is an anti-suffrage campaign actually. She's holding back the tide. So Dame Partington is a kind of um, symbol of conservatism and she is trying to hold back the tide. And what we can see here is the tide is socialist women 
mothers, working women, educated women, medical women, professional women. This is what the words that we can see coming in on this tide. And you can see this same symbolism of the dawn, of the new age rising at the back. So this image is from 10 years on from the one that I showed you from the Commonwealth, but we can see the parallels in the symbolism. So this is part of the suffrage imagery. One of Australia's leading political women, Vida Goldstein, somebody whose name we all should know, went to London in 1911, brought out by Emmeline Pankhurst's suffragettes in order to rally and provide a kind of inspirational symbol to the British suffrage movement of what had already been achieved in Australia. So this is a kind of reverse imperialism, yeah? This is the colonies going to England and teaching them how to suck eggs. And if you want a symbol of that, go to Parliament House and have a look at the women's suffrage banner that hangs there. And that is the perfect symbolism. In fact, it, it's the, the centrepiece of my book, You Daughters of Freedom, is, is that banner. And it is young Australia telling Mother England, trust the women mother, as I have done. So Vida is in London. Vida is best friends with Stella Miles Franklin. Stella is great friends with Mary and Marnie Griffin. And this is the world that these women lived in. They were unmarried. They were professional women earning their own incomes, living these independent lives. And, and th there was a great suffrage rally in 1911 where 100,000 people came out in the streets of England and Australian women walked behind that banner that now hangs in Parliament House, including the wife of the Prime Minister, Andrew Fisher. She was there and there are photos of that as well. So Australia was very proud of its reputation of being this trailblazing, young, independent thinking nation. It gives us room for pause, doesn't it, about how far we've come or how far we've fallen behind. The fact that once that we were a leader in world politics and now we seem to be so much a lagger. So what happens next in this story? Well, 1912, Marion and, and, and Walter are awarded the contract. They come to Australia. Of course, the other thing that happens is World War I is declared in 1914. And very much, very quickly, the curtain comes down on this sun rising on the horizon. We're now steeped for four years in misery and trauma and conflict and war. And I think that this has many effects um, on Australia. It certainly has an effect on our historical consciousness. What we as a nation take forward is after the, second, after the First World War is this idea that the birth of the nation was on the shores of Gallipoli, that our soldiers are the ones that fought for our freedom. And we lose this conception that, in fact, the birth of the nation was 1901. It was born through that constitution. It wasn't perfect. Our indigenous people were not only left out, they were deliberately excluded from that process. And that's something that we are still trying to reconcile now. The Uluru Statement is still calling for us to reconcile those sins of the past. But what also happens when that cloud of war comes down is that imperialism starts to take over again, this sense of us being followers. And we lose this sense of ourselves being this brave young democracy. I think it's interesting that later on Walter and Marion reflected that their vision for Australia that they had laid out in 1911 wasn't, or not Australia but for Canberra, that their vision wasn't um, in fact realised, that they were stonewalled bureaucratically all the way along. And um, Marion actually said in, in a letter to Miles Franklin that Walter's time in Australia was, and this is her line, a perpetual battle, one might say, against empire. So that idea that Australia kind of gets held back by conservatives at the moment, that it was really perched to try something incredibly new. Of course, also, what happens in that moment when Gallipoli overtakes 
this first decade of young um, activism and progressivism in Australia is that the women who were part of that movement are forgotten, that we have as a nation lost in our historical consciousness that women like Vida Goldstein and Catherine Helen Spence were globally recognised leaders um, and diplomats and spokespeople for this nation. And I think we can see in that a parallel that Mary and Marnie Griffin also gets lost in the narrative. Walter becomes the shining light on the hill, the one that everybody looks towards for the vision of Canberra. And it has only been slowly that this uh, legacy um, has started to be, and this narrative has started to be unpicked, and that Marion's role has really come to the fore, particularly through her watercolours. Um, one of which, actually for a long time they were all forgotten, and one of which was lost altogether. If you want to read about that in incredible story, Paul Daly's book on Canberra lays it out. And I think there are parallels between losing Marion's drawings and what happened with the women's suffrage banner, which was also lost and kept and found in the 1980s on top of a cupboard in London, um, all crinkled up and, and forgotten before it was brought back to Australia in 1988 and restored and, and put in Parliament. And now we can start to see that these are important parts of our nation's beginning. And I hope that when we start to um, bring back, the, I don't think these are hidden parts of our history, I think they are buried. They've been buried by ideology, they've been buried by mythology, and we have to work really hard to excavate them again and bring them back into the light. And so I'm delighted that through Glenda's work and through the work of the National Capital Authority in exhibitions like these, that we are really starting to once again be able to see the, the full extent of the complexity and the interestingness, that's not a word, of, uh, of our history. So I'll, I'll leave it there and um, hope that maybe you have some questions later on and I'll hand it over to Glenda. Thank you so much, Claire. I think you've set the mood, set the history. We know where we are. And just before I hand over to Glenda, who will introduce us to Marion and really give us that in-depth story of Marion, um, just before I started at the NCA, I went and did a tour in the United States, a Frank Lloyd Wright tour, architectural tour. It was fantastic. And the fellow who took it was a Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright aficionado. He'd been doing it for a number of years. And part of the tour, so we went to Falling, we started in Pittsburgh, went to Falling Waters, went to Chicago, went to Oak Park where Frank Lloyd Wright has his studio, which Marion managed. She wasn't just the secretary who paid the bills. She was an architect, she ran that studio. She was in charge while Frank was off with, just off. Um, <laughs> and it was into that studio where a young architect came and he of course was Walter. So she was not just a wife, she was an architect. She was a practicing architect and she was there. Anyway, as part of the Frank Lloyd Wright tour, one of the options was we could go into the bowels of the Milwaukee Museum and see some of Frank's, because um, Frank was a control freak, so any house he built, he built everything, including the wallpaper and the furnishings and the furniture and all the rest. So we were being taken in, if we wanted to, to the bowels of the, this actual museum to see his wallpaper books. And we had to put white gloves on and it was all very, you know, ooh, very exciting, frish on, frish on. But anyway, what took my eye was on the ledge there in that room was one of Marion's watercolours of Canberra. And so our tour guide, speaking to the curator at the Milwaukee Museum, well, because I went, oh, you know, that's Canberra, that's Marion, I live there, near, near. Hadn't taken this job at that stage, but it was like, Marion, Marion, Walter, Walter, you know, it was like, you know, when you're away from home and you see something, it's like walking onto a Qantas jet. So it was a bit like that. Anyway, so the tour guide turned to the curator and said, oh, yeah, they did some good stuff. Isn't it, wasn't it a shame? Isn't it such a shame that towards the end of her life, Marion had to get snippy and ask for more recognition? If she'd only, and the other guy went, yeah, if she'd only just kept her mouth shut and went into history. So, true, true, I, tell, I, tell, I was 
flabbergasted, speechless, said to my friend, oh, and she's like, Sally, back off, back off, we'll be all right. But I made it known that I didn't agree with them and that was ridiculous. And so for me, this is quite personal. This is paying them back. So, I didn't say that publicly. And I'm sure they're not watching. I forgot it's live stream. You can't just, you can't just chat like it's just people here. Anyway, so this is for Marion. This is for her. She, can, she should have got snippier probably a bit earlier. Um, so on that note, to hear about Marion and to learn about why she was the way she was, what were the influences on her and how she felt about her place in history. I'm going to hand over to Glenda Corporal, who's a well-known journalist and author. Next book. I'd say you're probably the definitive Marion. Do you call yourself Marion expert? I think we're going to. Yes, you are. Wonderful. Anyway, Glenda, can you please introduce us in more detail to Marion? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Well, uh, thank you. Two very impressive uh, women I have to follow, but thank you very much, um, Claire, for introducing the time. And I, I want to go over a little bit of the same thing, but more with an American focus. Uh, because when you look at Marion, you do, uh, and you just look at things through Marion's lens, you do see a sort of richer, more three-dimensional sort of social uh, social view of the world. Now, I think it's pretty amazing to be here on the lake um, celebrating Marion's 150th birthday. I mean, Marion grew up on Lake Michigan herself. Um, the lake was very much part of the Griffin plan, was very much part of Marion's early life. Um, and Marion herself was, as, as Claire's mentioned, I think very much ahead of her time in a lot of ways. Um, but she was uh, very, um, very much involved with community. She wanted to bring people together. She herself didn't want recognition. She was quite happy for Walter to get recognition. Uh, but she would have liked the idea that people are coming together in Canberra in this sort of ideal city that she and uh, Walter dreamed up on a cold winter in 1911. Um, so she would have been pleased that we're coming together to discuss some of her, um, some of her ideas and, and literally to be here uh, on the lake, which she fought for, was part of their plan. And I hope I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Um, the other thing is I've been interested in Marion for some time um, and I've lived in Canberra, I've lived in Washington, also Beijing, I've lived in London, several capitals, many capitals, but um, most cities have founding fathers and I think that you can argue that Marion is a founding mother or uh, she's certainly a founding uh, person in the history of Canberra. So I'm trying to actually elevate her beyond well, she's Walter Billy Griffin's wife. She's a little bit more advanced than you think. So I, I would sort of think if you were to have a Mount Rushmore of Canberra, that hopefully that her face would be on it. And <laughs> that's the next, the next challenge. Um, so Marion Marnie Griffin, that's a favourite photo of mine. Uh, we'll just go to the next, uh, the next slide. Uh, now, this is Marion's famous drawing. This is sort of why we're here today. This is why Canberra looks like what it is today. Um, when Marion and Walter were working on the plan, Marion really threw herself into the actual drawing side of things. And it was meant to be an ideal city nestled into the environment. And, but it's this killer drawing that Marion did um, in cold winter of 1911 that uh, sold the judges on the Canberra plan. And I think it's what, we're, we're, what we look at today. Um, and I'll hopefully sort of take you through some of Marion's drawing skills. Uh, so we'll go to the next slide, thank you. Um, now, when I was researching Marion, I wanted to write a book about, about her. I've written several books. I couldn't find a publisher. People were saying to me, um, really, ever we know about Walter Burley Griffin, there's books about Griffin. Um, so I ended up researching, getting drawn into her story. Uh, but I couldn't find a publisher, so in the end I self-published um, and um, uh, paid BookPod to, to, uh, to have it on their website. So um, it was a struggle um, to, to get the interest and to get someone interested in, in books on Marion. So I sort of feel uh, there is momentum which has evolved in the interest in Marion. It's good to sort of see that almost from the grassroots up in a way. 
Now, when I did this book, uh, in a way, how do you make someone that people don't know about sort of famous? And you, you talk about their relationship with, with other famous people. Um, so here I put her with um, her husband, Walter Burley Griffin, which, um, you know, we all say Mary and Marnie Griffin, husband, wife of Walter Burley Griffin. Uh, but also Frank Lloyd Wright, who's still one of the most famous architects in, in America. And she worked for him for about 13 years. So I'm trying to put her, well, I was at that point trying to put her uh, in between these two famous men. But it's sort of good that we're here today that we're sort of trying to elevate her perhaps to the next uh, level. Uh, can we move to the next slide? Um, so this is sort of roughly the, the pattern of what I'll talk about. Um, you know, go through her early life and try and then come to a conclusion about her legacy. Um, and I, I just want to make the point, before we go to the next slide, why study Marion? I mean, why bother? Why, why look at the history of Canberra? Why look at the history of Australia? Well, capital cities, and I've lived in several, um, are important in bringing the country together. It's, it's the one thing that the nation, and you see Australia very divided in some ways at the moment, it's one unifying factor, and capital cities are important in that, um, in their role, but also in the buildings and the layout and all the, the thought and the ideology that goes into the capital cities. So I'll just go to the next slide because I'll show you. The, this is this this is um, January six this year, um, a huge day in American history. This is what happens when you forget about where your capital city is, the importance of buildings. This is what happens when you promote division, um, promote set one side of your country against another. And it's very historic that you had an invasion of the, the American capital um, and stirred up by the president. So it's, it's actually quite significant. Um, and the whole role of um, what, and buildings and things like that in capital cities are very important, which we will go back into. Um, in the next, the next slide in looking at Marion's early days. So can we go to the next slide? Um, I will go to the next one now. So um, one of the interesting things when you look at the Griffins through Marion's lens and her story is going back to her, um, her, her family origins and her, her, um, her grandparents were friends with um, Abraham Lincoln. Now, the grandparents came from the New, Eng New England. They migrated to the state of uh, Illinois. There was a huge move, movement west um, in America. Um, and they lived in the town of Tremont. The town of Tremont is actually quite a small town. Uh, there, It's north of Springfield, which is the state capital. Now, in the 1840s and 50s, Abraham Lincoln was a lawyer living in Springfield. Um, and the court would do a circuit around, around the state of Illinois. Um, and so Abraham Lincoln was a lawyer. He would travel around um, to the major towns and cities. Um, and he would visit Tremont. He would visit the town of Marion's grandparents. Marion's grandfather was the local doctor. He was quite a big wig in the town and they would have people over. They were very community minded. So the town of Tremont was very big supporters of Abraham Lincoln. Um, and, um, but uh, I suppose one of the points I'm trying to make is that Lincoln's sense of a self-made man, of social de democrat, uh, of, being, um, uh, of being a very idealistic uh, person coming from a very ordinary background was something that infused Marion's family. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. So Marion was born in 1871. Um, in Chicago. Her mother had moved from Tremont um, to Chicago. She was a teacher. Um, and 1871 is a very big year in Chicago. It's the year of the Great Fire. Um, and a lot of Chicago, which was a very growing city in the Midwest, uh, was burnt down. And that actually led to a great rebuilding of Chicago, which saw it becoming an architectural centre. But Marion's parents um, decided to take them, her and her older brother, to out of Chicago to the north, to, to a lovely town on the lake to the north of Chicago. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, they went to this place called Evanston, which is um, um, it's commuting distance from Chicago. And she grew up in her first 10 years of her life, living literally living on the lake. Now, Walter grew up 
Uh, he was younger than her, grew up in western Chicago, but she grew up on the lake. Uh, so I hopefully can add this argument of the lake being part of Marion's thinking. Um, so um, we'll just go to the next slide. Now, Marion talked about um, in her diary or in her book, uh, Magic of America, she describes this ideal childhood she had growing up, living on the lake, um, roaming free. She was quite a tomboy, but in her, in her description, she's, um, she describes as sort of standing on the lake, the lake being so important to her, um, to her uh, growing up. Um, and you can see this observation of nature, this love of nature, and this very independent young girl. Um, she loved to climb trees. Um, and growing up as sort of quite an independent, feisty woman. Move to the next one. Now, um, Dwight Perkins is quite interesting. He's her cousin. He's a little bit older than her, and he also grew up in that area around north of, north of um, Chicago. Um, Marion was named after his mother, Marion. Um, his father, Leslie, which is Marion's uncle, uh, fought in the Civil War for Abraham Lincoln, and he came back and he was not, he was injured uh, and died quite young after, um, after Dwight was um, born. But Dwight himself did also have this view of growing up on the lake. The, very, and the family was very sort of fiercely environmental. Um, and so Dwight was sent out to work at the age of 12 because uh, his father had died, and he ended up working in an architect's office. And Chicago having been burnt down, um, there was a huge amount of rebuilding. Um, so Dwight um, decided to become an architect, or he got, a, he got a work in an architect's office. But he saw architecture as, as a sense of um, social justice, of a way of building communities where you had parks, you had spaces for children, you had um, that ordinary people could live in good conditions. So Dwight, I think he was only a few years older than Marion, um, th well, they had common thoughts. And um, so uh, Dwight actually went off to MIT to do, a, to do an architecture degree. And I, there's no sort of evidence, exact evidence of what he said to her, but uh, I believed he inspired her to also go, to become an architect and to go to MIT. So. Just move to the next the next slide. Um, so this is uh, MIT in Boston around the time that Marion went, 1890. Um, and you know she was unusual. She was the second woman to do an architecture degree. Um, her degree was financed by the daughter of a wealthy woman who was a friend of Dwight Perkins' mother. So in that sort of circle that Dwight Perkins' uh, family mixed in, um, the first woman to graduate from architecture in um, MIT was a woman called Sophia Hayden. She could never get a job as an architect. Um, she ended up having to be a teacher and at one point she had a nervous breakdown. So, um, you know, it was pioneering, it was quite pioneering. We'll go to the next slide. So Mary comes back to, graduates, comes back to Chicago. Now, one of the things that she's very good at is drawing um, and she, she expanded her drawing. She took drawing lessons. She loved drawing nature. So you'll sort of see some recurring themes here of her love of nature. This is, um, this is a drawing she did for Marshall Fields um, department store. Uh, but I'm just sort of showing you Marion's drawing and her love of nature, incorporating of nature in, in, in what she did. Um, she, we'll go to the next one. Right. Um, Marion came back, first of all, she worked for her cousin Dwight, her cousin Dwight, who would employ a woman architect, uh, but she also did some commissions on her own. Marion was a Unitarian, um, and the Unitarian churches are very community, very um, environmentally minded, uh, as was Dwight's family, as was Marion Perkins. She was asked by a Unitarian, uh, her Unitarian minister to design a church. Um, and this is, was built in Evanston, north of Chicago. Um, you can see here the light coming in from, from the ceiling. Uh, you can see also a, um, a mural that she did on the back wall, that's of Christ on the cross, but also um, the idea of these planter boxes where she's bringing in the outdoors into the church. Uh, go to the next one. 
right. Um, so Marion f came back, uh, worked with Dwight. Um, Dwight fell on hard times, uh, and then she worked for, with Frank Lloyd Wright. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright was in this broader circle that Marion and Dwight were in. Um, his, his uncle was a Unitarian priest in the, or minister in the south of Chicago. Um, Marion Perkins went to his church, um, but they were like-minded in the sense of being um, environmental and very community conscious. So she, this is about, we get it, we're about 1896, 97. Um, they were working in downtown Chicago, but Wright lived in Oak Park in the west of Chicago. He wanted to have an office uh, or a, an office near his house. So he and Marion effectively designed an office or a studio to adjoin to his house in, in Oak Park. And one of the things they wanted to do was have a, a separate entrance to the house. So Marion designed these sort of vertical stalks, which were meant to be wise, wise birds. And so you can actually go to this today and you can go in through uh, to the studio through the, um, the pillars that Marion had designed. Just next slide. Um, and this is, this is the um, Oak Park studio that Sally would have been to. Um, there's several rooms there, but this is the studio where Marion worked and um, Walter joined about 1901. Um, so this is where Marion and Walter would have met and they're both, there's a number of rooms attached there. Um, so they would have been working sort of side by side um, with Frank Lloyd, Frank Lloyd Wright. Okay, I'll go to the next slide. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright realised Marion's skills as a drawer. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright's um, architecture was very unusual, it was quite geometric. Um, people talk about the Prairie School, there was a lot of horizontality in his, in his architecture and it was unusual. So in a way he had to sell, he had to sort of sell his unusual designs and he sort of pushed Marion into the drawing side of it because she was so good. And so this is, this is um, another church in Oak Park which is still there, it's called Unity Temple. The original temple was, the original church was burnt down. and. Um, um, right design, it, was, it looks a bit boxy on the outside, but inside it's absolutely stunning. Uh, but again, here you've got Marion um, drawing it, making Wright look good. Uh, you can start to see the hanging vines and the use of the environment to make his building look good. Uh, we'll go to the next one. Um, 1905, um, Frank Lloyd Wright went to Japan. He came back with armfuls and armfuls of Japanese prints. Um, there, was a, there had been a great opening up of Japan um, in the, in the 18, 80s, 1890s. The, the Impressionists in Europe were very interested in Japanese art and so was Wright. And so essentially he's coming back to this studio with all these arm loans of Japanese prints and that started to infuse Marion's uh, drawing. Um, so this is sort of quite famous in the sense of Wright, who never acknowledged anyone, um, had actually picked up a pencil and wrote uh, by Marion after Wright and Hiroji, who was the quite famous Japanese um, painter who, who did the sort of famous drawings of uh, beautiful um, sort of tsunami um, uh, waves and things like that. Anyway, uh, we'll go to the next. So, um, thank you. Um, 1909, Frank Lloyd Wright, this beautiful relationship in the studio um, was essentially smashed apart. Wright, Wright ran off with the wife of a client, uh, it was very scandalous, and his, the Wrights, the studio, and this, is, this was the beginning actually of a hatred between um, Marion and, and um, Wright because she sided with his wife, so there's, there's a lot of history in the bad relationship subsequently between Marion and Wright. Uh, but anyway, she moves back to downtown Chicago in a place called Steinway Hall, where Walter had already moved. He'd already had a fight with, with um, Frank Lloyd Wright over money. Um, so she meets up in Steinway Hall with Walter, who had an office in the top of Steinway Hall, which had been designed by Dwight Perkins. Um, and then she rekindles her, her relationship with him as she's working out some of the projects from Wright's office. I'll go to the next one. Um, Separately, there aren't very many houses that Marion herself designed individually, um, and this this was something that she was doing in the interregnum between when she left. Well, the commission had come into Wright's office, but she actually did the, this house. 
Uh, there's a bunch of houses in Decatur, which is east of Springfield. And you can see here the beautiful sort of stained glass windows in the roofs. Um, and they're, they're, if I've been to this house several times. There's, um, uh, you can sit there and through the stained glass windows, you see the environment coming into that house. We'll go to the next one. Um, someone also who came into Frank Lloyd Wright's um, studio uh, before he left, and Wright was not going to be telling uh, Henry Ford that he's about to run off with someone else's wife. Uh, so uh, Marion also did a design of a house in um, Rouge River, Michigan for Henry Ford. Now, this wasn't built, but you can see Marion's design. It's, it's on a river. It's made of stone and it's nestled into the environment because I'm just trying to show you some pictures of Marion on her own before she marries, um, marries Walter. Go to the next slide. Um, Marion and Walter uh, met and they married in June 1911. Um, they eloped. Part of it, we don't exactly know why they eloped, but his parents didn't really like her because she was unusual. She was a bit odd. Uh, you know, there weren't that many women who weren't sort of sweet little women and she's there uh, having worked for Wright and she was five or six years older than Walter as well. Um, so one of the projects they worked on was this thing called Mason City, Iowa, which was, a lit which was a, an ideal sort of suburb. And this is a drawing, a bird's eye drawing that Marion did of this, of this suburb. Um, just, we'll go to the next one. Um, and this is a house, uh, there's several houses in this in this suburb that they developed. And this is the one I believe Marion had the most to do with. Um, it was the, the person she built it for was Joshua Melson, who had come into Wright Studio originally. Um, and you can see the use of stone, which there was in the, in the Henry Ford house, but it's built into the side of a creek. Um, so um, so this, is the original, this is the actual house. But what you're seeing on the right is the evolution of Marion's drawing techniques. She's using these vertical Japanese scrolls, which is something that she's using to describe, to draw the house, but also to make, to sell it to you, to say how beautiful it is, and also to set it again in the environment. So we will go to the next slide. All right. Um, now, um, Claire talked about 1911, and, and so I'm, which I think is actually quite critical. That was when they did the plan. That was, um, so in a sense, I'll try and talk to you a little tiny bit about what Chicago was like in 1911. And this is one of my sort of favourite, I love this photo. Now, Chicago was the, you know, American women didn't have the vote then. They did look at Australia and look, look at it. Um, they thought that if women had the vote, it also would lead to a whole lot of other things for, uh, there was very bad conditions for working of children. Um, the Chicago is very crowded and dirty with lots of migrants. So that it wasn't just the votes for women, it was, it was social justice, um, better living conditions. And they, but um, the women of Chicago, Chicago was the centre of the women's trade union movement. And there was, it was a huge push for the votes for women, but as part of a broader sort of social justice, um, community standards um, campaign. I'll just go to the next slide. Um, one of the women, one of the women that was prominent in Chicago at the time was a woman called Jane Adams. Uh, she had what's called a settlement house, or she set up. She was reasonably wealthy and used some of her wealth to set up a, a, like a poor, ha well, a, a bit more advanced than that, but a house in the south of Chicago where um, people would come to um, help the poor, but also come together for community and arts. And Marion and the first meeting of the. Um, Chicago Arts and Craft Movement was in Hull House, which she founded in 1898, and Marion and Frank Lloyd Wright were there. Um, but Jane Addams was a sort of almost a symbol. She was the first American woman to have a Nobel Peace Prize. And, but she, to me, is a symbol of, the, of really the feisty women of Chicago who are fighting for the vote, but fighting for um, better conditions of, for workers. We'll go to the next one. Um, now, attracted to Chicago at that time, but they didn't know each other um, until the Griffins won, was Miles Franklin, who had arrived in Chicago about 1905, and she was working for the women's trade union movement. Um, another woman older than her, Alice Henrys from Melbourne, she had separately been attracted to Chicago, um, and they both worked for the women's trade union movement. We'll move to the next one. 
slide. Um, and I'm just uh, putting this here. Um, Miles Franklin, while in Chicago, wrote on Dearborn Street, which is in Chicago, which wasn't published at the time, and I have read it, it's not that very good, but anyway, it's sort of evidence of her being in Chicago before she went over, over um, overseas. We'll go to the next slide. Um, so w w I'm just sort of, sort of setting the scene for 1911 when the Griffins were there designing the Canberra plan, and Walter had talked and talked about entering this plan. When it came, when they learned, he didn't do anything. They were busy. So she was the one that pushed and pushed and pushed him and said, look, you've been talking about this for ages, let's, let's do it. And Miles Franklin, who got to know them after, the, they got a lot of publicity after the plan, she met them, became friends. And so this was, um, and then to Claire's point, that their vision of Australia as being this sort of bold new democracy of women having the vote, um, anyone who studied industrial relations will know the harvester judgment of 1908 I set a basic wage. So there was this sort of vision and to, you know, Miles Franklin um, recorded this later as this was the spirit, you know, never had there been a better opportunity to sort of start anew with this bold capital of a new democracy. So we'll go to the next level. Um, uh, so Marion did a lot of drawings. I don't think this actually is her drawing, but um, we're just spend a tiny bit of time on the plan for Canberra. Um, essentially, this is a bird's eye view, and there were two axes, a water axis, which was damming the Malongolo, which was to make a series of basins and lakes, and a land axis, which goes from Mount Ainsley to what was Mount Currajong, which is now Capitol Hill, and Mount Bimbury, I think you call So the idea was um, that there would be these two main axes, but also you would have this sort of triangular um, shape of the government on on the on the south side, the people living on the north side, um, and that the centre was a capital hill, uh, and the government groupings would be nestled. The Parliament House would be below Capitol Hill, and the government the government buildings would be nestled into the environment on that side, and people would be living on this side. That um, uh, civic is what was roughly where it is in their plan. On the other side was to be market, and between that there would people would be um, people citizens of Canberra would be sort of living and shopping and enjoying themselves, looking across to the government buildings. So we'll go to the next one. Now this is Marion's drawings, um, and again this theme of Marion's drawings is selling you the concept, a very unusual concept. Um, this is the Capitol. Now their idea was not to have. Congress or Parliament on the top of the hill, but to have a capitol on the top of a hill. Now, first of all, look at the drawing, seeing how beautiful it is and how detailed it is. You can also see some beautiful white paint. This is, um, as soon as I say it, you'll see it in all her buildings, that use of this white paint to um, highlight without overcoming and also to somehow shimmer and reflect. And you'll see how she's got the, the drawing of the capitol the parliament buildings there, other government buildings reflecting in, in the lake. Um, we'll just go to the next slide. Um, and this is a, a close-up. And the idea of the capital, what they wanted at the, at the capital was a public building that was above parliament. So this was some national space, uh, a building. They, they talked about having the archives there. Um, that it be above, that, that parliament be a, be that the, that the capital be above parliament, the people are above parliament. Now, where did this come from? Um, we know that Rome has a capital and we know, and Walter talked about various times, the Capitoline Hill in Rome. Um, and again, how do we know when Walter and Marion were talking to each other, who thought up what? But when they designed Canberra, Mar uh, Walter had never left America and Marion had been to Rome. Um, so we'll just show you the next, the next slide. Um, Michelangelo redesigned the top of the Capitoline Hill to have a space, to have a capital. And this, this and there was um, the idea this was a public space that had things like the National Archives. So this is part of the Griffin's thinking. We know Marion in 1896 went to Europe on a trip with her brother. Um, now, it was who was the one that thought this up? We don't know. but. Again, Marion had been overseas and Walter hadn't. Uh, so we'll next, we'll go to the next slide. 
Um, and this, of course, we're back to the killer drawing. Um, you know, Marion's Japanese style infusing her drawing. The idea of the city that's nestled into the landscape, not buildings plonked on top. Um, in fact, there's a little bit of a story about this. They were so late in doing their buildings that or doing the drawings that they rushed to get them off and there was just a sketch of this one and and the actual beautiful drawing was sent sort of later um, anyway and so um, we'll go to the next slide now try and get you to Australia um, now this is Australia May uh, 1912 right blokes um, this is where they announced who won the, the group they picked the Griffin plan and it was a two to one decision and I believe that Marion's drawing sold the day. Um, in the front is King O'Malley who's born in America but uh, and in the back actually is Keith Murdoch who's one of the journalists who who covered it. Uh, anyway so having seen the picture of the feisty women of Chicago um, here's Australia May 1912 I'll go to the next level. Um, so long story short, the Griffins come to Australia in 1914 uh, and they come to live in Sydney or they think they're going to live in Sydney. We'll just go to the next level. Um, they bought some land in, in Vaucluse and Mar they were going to have a house there. And um, You can see Marion's drawings, again the, the, the vertical Japanese scrolls. Uh, but in the end, Walter's job was, was in Melbourne. He was federal capital director and that was a full-time job. And in the end, that uh, Marion ended up moving down to, to Melbourne. We'll go to the next one. Now, Walter was working full-time as federal capital director, but he had this idea that he wanted to evolve an Australian form of architecture as well. One of the people who came into their office was um, a Greek Australian called AJ Lucas, who wanted uh, who wanted them to design a cafe for him. Now, while a lot of people say this is Walter Valley Griffin, having shown you Marion's church, um, Marion essentially threw herself into it. You can see that the light coming in from the top. You can see um, the 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 mural at the back. You can see this infusion of. Uh, trees and plants in, the, in, this, in this whole layout. Uh, we'll just go to the next slide. Um, this was called the Fern Room. Um, and again, you've got the, you know, Marion was using lots of ferns. It's, it seems to me like a pre-art deco sort of feel. Um, she designed the, she designed the um, seats and there's something underneath for the for women to put their handbags. She even designed the, pla the, the, um, uh, the, the menu and the invitations and Dame Nellie Melba was at the opening of it. So this was quite a cool um, cafe. But I think you can see Marion's sort of view of the world in being infused into this. We'll move to the next slide. Um, now they commissioned a woman, um, Bertha Murfield, a landscape architect, to do this uh, mural at the back of the cafe. By this time the Griffins had actually fallen in love with the Australian bushland. Um, and they, just as the architects of the Prairie School in America wanted to incorporate the American environment in their architecture, they were very, they were very interested and passionate about the Australian uh, trees and plants and how different they were from European trees and plants. So um, Mary, in fact, became very friendly with Bertha Murfield, who did this, um, who did this mural. Uh, but she threw herself, I think there was that element of also her being frustrated in that Walter's full time working on the Capitol. She's helping out with some projects, but she threw herself into the study of Australian plants and trees. So we'll just go to the next level. Um, the Griffins did lots and lots of bushwalking. They, um, in Sydney and in Melbourne, they, every weekend they would go lots of weekends. Uh, they really studied Australian trees and plants and um, again, loved the natural environment. In fact, Ma Marion said as a child, she would, you know how people say, if you go outside, you're gonna get sick. Well, she would say, if I, if I go inside, I'm gonna get sick. So she was always wanting to go on bush walks. Um, and we'll go to the next slide. Um, so Marion really did throw herself into drawing the Australian bushland and Bertha Murfield invited her on a trip to Tasmania, a sketching trip to Tasmania. Um, and that's Marion on the left, you can see, sort of very tall and skinny, a little bit stooped. Uh, Bertha Murfield and another, another Australian painter, Tasmanian painter, Mabel Hookie. 
Um, so they went on this sketching trip, and this is the beginning of what we call Marion's forest portraits. We'll go to the next one. Oh, oh Marion took lots of photos, so that, and these, these are actually in the National Library. Um, go to the next one. Um, now this is her, her, one of her most famous ones. There she is, so they went to Southport in the bottom of Tasmania, and she had this sort of feeling of Australia being this ancient land close to the South Pole. Um, and this was one of her most beautiful ones. She sketched it, and when she came back to Melbourne, she drew it on, on silk. Um, again, the vertical Japanese screens, and she also wrote um, that, you know, in Australia, the, she, she said the arch archangel who created Australia was, you know, the, the best in the world, and you don't have to make anything up, you just draw what you see. Um, so this is sort of the beginning of her, what we call her forest portraits. We'll have a quick look through, um, that's another one she did, and, um, from another one there. Um, and this one, in um, a few years ago at the Block Museum, which is in Evanston, north of Chicago, has got some of the prints and they did, a, um, uh, they did an exhibition of her forest portraits. Um, and there's another one of this, um, of, uh, there's another one here. Um, and this book called Drawing in the Form of Nature, which I think you can get on Amazon and it's really starting to go to the next level. Um, the Griffins had this idea of planting the hills of Canberra with all the different plants of Australia. Now, in a sense, it was impractical, but um, I think that was where the idea of Red Hill is. And so Marion, now living in Melbourne while Walter's working there, is throwing herself into the study of it and also colour coding. Uh, how do you colour code all the plants, the red ones, the wattles, all this sort of thing? And so she worked on these booklets, and these two are in the National Library. Um, there were about eight of them. Uh, so it was meant to be a guide for people of Australian plants. Go to the next one. Um, now, here we are about 1920, um, and Marion and Walsh living in Melbourne, they, they built this house, a one-room house called Foliota, which apparently means mushroom. Um, so they loved this house, but at the same time, life was not very good for Walter because he was being pushed out of the plan for Canberra. Um, there were lots of different factors. You can have a whole lecture on Walter's fight with the bureaucrats. The first reaction to their plan was uh, a lot of people thought the lake was way too expensive uh, and that pervaded in Australia for, for years. Um, a lot of people didn't like this young American guy coming out, telling people what to do. A lot of the public servants were uh, a lot older, They'd, some of them fought in the Boer War, they were sort of engineers. Anyway, there was huge, many fights. And by, so by 1920, Griffin effectively was pushed out of the plan for Canberra. But the Griffins had, had decided, well, they still wanted to do an ideal city in Australia. Um, so we'll go to the next one. Um, so hence their idea of Castle Crag. If they couldn't do Canberra, if they couldn't do this ideal city, um, they, they wanted to do an ideal suburb and they had uh, originally thought of living in Sydney. Um, this, so they bought some land, they formed a consortium, bought some land in Castle Crag. Um, and the, um, this, is, this is showing the, the Griffins loved to canoe. And in fact, it was Marion, when she was, like, she was like courting water, that suggested they buy a canoe together, canoeing around the rivers of Chicago. So the canoeing came from, from her. Um, we'll go to the next, uh, the next level. Um, so when they went to Castle Crag, it was pretty denuded. The trees had been all, um, all sort of cut down. Um, so they set about replanting. We'll go to the next one. Um, now, this is Walter's design. This is the idea of setting the city into the contours. And in the case of Castle Crag, it's, it slopes down into the, um, to the water. And so they did the curved roads, the idea of being that the road should be in the contour of the environment, not, again, plonked on it. And that also allowed the houses to, to look out. We'll go to the next one. Um, Marion again set herself about selling the, the idea of Canberra, of, of Castle Crag. Um, this ideal city with their unusual, with unusual um, buildings, uh, a lot of stone. Um, now you'll start to see in Marion's drawings the white paint, um, the vertical scrolls. Um, so the Greater City Development Association was the consortium they formed, and the first two houses are called GSD 1 and 2. Go to the next level. Um, so this is them building these houses which were very unusual in Castle Crag. 
Um, let's just go to the next one, we'll see what that's... Um, so that's a Marian drawing of it, again, trying to sell people because they were unusual. A lot of people didn't like them. Banks would not lend to people um, to, buy, to, to build the Griffin houses in Castle Crag. Um, so um, again, Marian's trying to s is selling this idea of a community in the environment. Just go to the next level. Um, this is another drawing. This is the grand house where the Griffins ended up uh, living for a while in Castle Crag. Now we'll go to the next level there. Hopefully we can make, click on the left hand corner and this is, a, this is in the National Film and Sound Archives and this is a video, a Castle Crag, a little sales video. And this is Marion, so there she is. These women have come up to Castle Crag to see this unusual suburb and she's not sitting talking with them, she's entertaining them, she's selling them the idea of, um, of this unusual suburb. So they're driven up, I think, from Sydney, and um, there's, uh, the guy, there's a guy here, uh, the guy you'll see here, I think, drove them up. Um, he's having a, a cigarette. <laughs> um, and they had, uh, one of the houses was, they had flat roofs, so having parties on the houses. And this was Marion. Marion's this sense of community. Um, it wasn't just uh, unusual houses, it wasn't just roads, curved roads, she threw herself into, their house was always open, she'd always invite people over, um, and she threw herself into entertaining, uh, turning Castle Crag into a community and attracting a whole lot of people to that suburb, which made it uh, infuse life into it. Go to the next one. Um, this is Marion in the, in the garden with, uh, that was Walter's father came out. A um, woman on the left is a woman called Louise Lightfoot who was an architect but wanted to be a dancer and she ends up being um, palling up with, um, uh, with a Russian emigre called Mich Mikhail Berlikoff and they end up forming the beginning of what was the Australian ballet. So these were sort of the people that the Griffins were surrounding themselves with. We'll go to the next level. Um, Marion was married when she was 40. Um, we don't know whether she couldn't have children, but she loved children. And part of what they did at Castle Crag was creating this community. There was childcare, there was encouraging children. Um, and this was, this is, you know, they had Christmas parties. So it was um, this breathing life into this community. And she really believed in letting children sort of roam free as she had done. Go to the next one. Um, the other thing she loved to do was plays. Uh, she had a, quite a classical education. Uh, and there was an area uh, which, they, which Marion actually bought with her own money, with her mum's um, inheritance, uh, a part of Castle Crag adjoining to the estate, where um, they built, in fact, a, a theatre into the side of the hill. And, and she, she gave um, and put on all these plays. And that, again, created all sorts of people attracting to Castle Crag, quite unusual people. And you wonder what she would have done if she was here. But anyway, we'll go to the next level. And she would direct them. Uh, and she was... Um, uh, so uh, anyway, so, so there she was. We're, we're in, in the 30s now. And life was not that good in the 30s with depression. Walter goes to India because he can get business there. She ends up following him. And sadly, um, he dies there of... Um, he, I think he fell off a ladder, but there was also internal complications. She comes back. Now, she comes back from India. She, one of the last things, she decides to go home to Chicago, but one of the last things she did was come to Canberra. Um, she got someone to drive her, and they went up to the top of Mount Ainsley and looked at what was happening. And she was actually very pleased with what was happening, except she said, you really need the lake. So we'll go to the next level. Um, so she goes back to Chicago. One of the things, she wants to write about this. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright had become famous and she hated Frank Lloyd Wright. First of all, he ran, he ran off, left his wife and six kids. But also, Frank Lloyd Wright was very jealous that Griffin won the plan because he thought, well, Griffin just worked for him with some junior guy and suddenly he's famous. And so all sorts of jealousy. And, and another, another thing when a lot of people wouldn't deal with Wright when he came back because he had left his wife and children. And some of the things that the Mason City, some of the people gave the work to the Griffins, not to Wright because he was sort of um, scandalous and a bit tarnished. So this animosity developed between the Griffins and, and Wright. 
but Marion, in try coming back to Chicago from 1937 onwards, was trying to say, well, look, this is what my husband Walter has been doing, this is what we've been doing in Australia. And so this Magic of America, which she tried to get printed, and she wasn't able to, but it's now been digitised, does, is what we use a lot today to give the insights of the Griffin, so of what the Griffins did, what her insights were. And I, I think her doing this kept a lot of things on the record. Um, so we'll just go to the next one. 19, um, 1961, she dies. Um, she's living with her niece. She's in poverty. Nobody really knew her. Uh, what she didn't know was by this time, Robert Menzies, bless his cotton little socks, had was pushing for the lake. And so this was already being excavated because she didn't know that. Um, just go to the next slide. Um, and this is, this is Menzies opening, opening Lake Burley Griffin. Um, had Marion known, she would have been very pleased, but she, but, um, uh, she didn't. But it was a tribute to Menzies that he called it Lake Burley Griffin, probably didn't know about Marion. We'll just go to the next line. So I'll just have a quick um, re-look at her legacy. I mean, again, we're going back to this famous painting which changed the course of Australian history um, with her Japanese-infused drawing techniques, uh, the Griffin's idea of a city built into the environment, but it was Marion's beautiful drawings that essentially sell the idea. <coughs> go to the next one. Um, and this is the view from Mount Ainsley now. And it, I mean, we can go into all sorts of detail which we won't about why it, it didn't evolve the same way they wanted it. But it is pretty amazing that 1911, you see her picture, and then, you, you know, today you can sort of see this. Um, so we'll go to the, the next level. Now, part of the Griffin plan was to have this capital above Parliament, and it, it being a public space. Now, um, when they put Old Parliament House where it was, that wasn't, wasn't where Parliament House was supposed to be. And Griffin himself said, if you put that there, you won't be putting Parliament House where he wanted it, which was a bit further up the hill, nestled into the hill. Um, but um, Romelda, any, ultimately they picked the site, Capitol Hill, so that's where the Parliament's got to be. Romaldo Jurgula was inspired by the Griffin plans, and I've met him and talked to him, he's sadly died, but he, when he was studying architecture in Rome in 19, well, in, uh, as a young man, the Griffin plan was actually on the walls of his university, because he's told me that. Uh, so in his, so he then uh, were, was involved in designing, or I think it might have entered a competition for what we call New Parliament House, and Part of it was the people over the top. You can see the grass is that Griffin plan. And it's not that obvious from here, but it's quite, um, his whole point was to get a capital, some, something of the Griffin's plan in, in that design. Uh, go to the next one. Um, the National Arboretum I went a few years ago, and it's, it's actually stunning. It's really beautiful. I think um, people who've done have done a great job. And they do pay a tribute to both Griffins in it. And there was an arboretum in the Griffin plan, and Marion, with her idea of, you know, lots of different plants and trees, would have liked. And I think this, you've got to say, this is a Griffin legacy, fits in with their ideals, um, and something, Mar you know, it, it, it is one of her legacies. Go to the next, next slide. Um, so uh, I suppose this is my attempt. Part of the problem with Marion's work is it is all over the place. Some of it's in the archives, some of it's in the museum. In the, in the library. Some of it's in Northwestern University, some of it's in private collections. So my argument is you have to see this whole body of work. I don't know whether there's some exhibition that could be put on that, that put together all her body of work. So it's the plan for Canberra, it's her passion for Australian trees, um, which you have to take all together in assessing Marion's legacy. So we'll just go to the Next, right, so, so I suppose what I'm trying to do this argument is Marion is being a founding mother of Canberra, of being a sort of fitting person that you can uh, study. Not only did she have real effect in Canberra, but uh, I think her thoughts and ideals have infused um, Canberra to an extent, but I think it's if you study her, um, it, it is inspiring and um, it is part of Canberra's history. And, Probably, um, in a sense, again, when you see those events of, of the Capitol in, in Washington, you see the importance of studying the history and the ideals behind the designs of a capital and, and a capital city. 
So I think I've um, probably over-talked, but I will uh, leave you there for, if you want some questions. No. Yes. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for the Fantastic. Thank you so much. We'll That's let right. you just draw breath for okay. a moment. Yes. Um, we do have to be quite COVID safe with our questioning, hence my gloves and the wipe. So just um, at a steady pace, we'll start down there. Um, I, I wondered if in your researching papers of the Griffins, you came across any reason why two people who, on every record that I've ever seen, mm. had attractive personalities and loved, were sociable people who loved mixing with people and got on with a terrific diversity of people generally, attracted such amazing opprobrium from the, from the public sector when they came to Australia. The fact that Griffin uh, was greeted by John Smith Murdoch the day he arrived in Sydney, uh, following instructions from the then director of the what was to become the Federal Capital Commission, um, who had instructed him not to do so, it was a sort of animus towards the Griffins that I, I'm never able to understand that sort of a deep animus that seemed to be amongst the Australian bureaucrats um, towards them. That are, it, it doesn't make sense given their, their attractive personality and the terrific job they were supposed to do. Well, that was, um, I know what you're talking about, um, that was before they'd ever met them, of course. So the, what, what happened was when the, the, when the competition was announced, uh, they won, and that was it. It's sort of like, oh, thanks very much. And they're, he's getting, they're getting all this publicity in Chicago. Uh, but um, there had been um, a lot of, uh, there'd been some very alternate plans, and, and there was this called this, deep, this departmental plan got going, which is a different plan that the, the local public servants preferred. And there was this view that the Griffin plan was a bit too expensive. Um, so the public servant said, well, thanks very much, King O'Malley, you can, you know, whatever, we're going to go ahead with our design. So in a sense, um, so Griffin was quite shocked, he thought he was going to be invited here. So even before he came, um, there was this other plan developed by various public servants who thought it was more practical, um, that they wanted to go ahead with that. And so that, in fact, almost was going to be the case, except the Griffin pushed and pushed to, to come out here. So um, there was a view of, well, thanks very much, you've done the competition, now we're just going to get on with our own lives. <laughs> so there was, there was definitely that. And, so, and, and Walter, in fact, um, saw a, a copy of the departmental plan and, and said, no, this is not what I wanted, and tearing his hair out. And, and he, in fact, pushed to come out here and came in 1913 and they moved in 1914. So probably the animosity towards the Griffin plan was before anyone ever met the Griffins. Yeah, there's a whole lot of factors. Um, you've got this element of a 36-year-old young American coming out to Australia telling these 50-year-old guys who'd fought in the Boer War, who'd been public servants in in New South Wales, who are injured, who'd, who'd lived and breathed this site for years. Um, you know, who's this guy telling us what to do? Um, another layer was um, whenever you have a big project, you know, think the Opera House or whatever, the controversy and, you know, they, uh, the Griffins befriended King O'Malley, uh, then he was in and out of as Minister of Home Affairs. And then this other guy called Archibald came in and he hated them and, and he was friendly with the public servants. So there's a lot of people before they even met them who, who just said, look, we want to do our own thing, who are you? There are other threats. Um, the Griffins were quite anti-war. Um, so they were mixing with people like um, Daniel Mannix, other, other sort of people who were, who were anti-conscription. So I don't think that helped. Um, and so, but generally there was a feeling of the, the public servants who had been here for years and years involved with the site, involved with what had happened to so say, we just want to do our thing and just go away. Um, and so, um, again, that was not necessarily because the Griffin's personality, that was they, before they even, they, even met, they even met them. And there was a, the public servants were literally thwarting Griffin at every, every, every turn and there was a Royal Commission in 1916 
which um, end up exonerating Griffin and, uh, you know, there was a whole lot of other things. When he arrived, World War I happened, so there wasn't the money to go ahead. But uh, So there were many sort of threads in it. Um, but there, were, there was a little bit of politics in that there was... America was very latent to the First World War. They were... Um, and again, if you go back to the Civil War, they, there was no romance of war in America. Um, so their political views weren't like what Billy Hughes's views were. So many different threads, and it does say a lot about Australia of the time. The ministers were changing all the time. Griffin was very close to O'Malley, who was a big supporter. And then O'Malley got twice sidelined, eventually lost his seat about 1917. Um, so when O'Malley effectively got pushed out, Griffin's days were numbered. So um, there's a whole lot of politics in, in, in it. And, but that, that's before people met the Griffin. And Marion was pretty outspoken and not everybody like, agreed with their views as well. So that's a, that's a whole nother lecture. <laughs> Thank you, Glenn, that's great. As I understand it, the Griffins who designed the capital, especially uh, Marion with all the drawings, I think they were envisaging a city of about 25,000 people we are now approaching 500,000, mm. 20 times that. Yes. If they could see the capital as it is now, evolving, uh, from your insight of understanding how they thought, have you an insight of what they would think of how uh, their capital is today? Um, well, there, you know, the thing is, if the Griffiths <coughs> plan was done, it, it would have all, it would have worked in a way, it would have nestled into the environment. One factor happened, World War I happened, and one of the essential, one of the changes was the war memorial. Now, if you had not got that war memorial, that, that the area on this side would have been, was meant to be very live, it was meant to be civic there, market there, people would be living, um, and, and there was supposed to be a casino, what they called a casino, it was a public building where the war memorial is, and that whole... Um, way was meant to be a pub, people would be walking there uh, and there was supposed to be like um, on the water like a um, sports stadium. Um, so there's an, a Griffin apparently did accept that the War Memorial idea. I think they would have been disappointed um, in a lot of ways but I think what the idea of a city on the lake of, of people who can live here and really enjoy the environment I think that they, that's what they, they would have definitely liked that. And I think regardless, that's what has been preserved in their plan, I think. A, a city that's nestled into the environment and people can um, in, enjoy a more perhaps outdoor life than you can in a lot of other capital. So, you know, I think they would have been disappointed. There is an argument to say, well, hey, there are only two people in Chicago in 1911. You know, they did pretty well. I mean, the government gazetted the street plans um, after Walter was put out. So for have two people on the other side of the world um, that we're talking about today and still still affecting the design of Canberra, I think that's not too bad. But yeah, they would have been there would have been things they would have been disappointed in, yes. Uh, a woman from Chicago graduates from an elite university in Boston and returns and establishes herself as a professional and ends up married to a young guy that joins the firm. Have you thought whether Michelle Obama might promote the release <laughs> of your book? Yeah, both from Chicago, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, um, interesting, yes. Uh, in fact, when Obama came out, I was trying to get the government to actually get him to go and see the Griffin drawings. I thought that would be amazing, but never happened. Um, yeah, so interesting, an interesting idea. Maybe Michelle can play Marion in the movie version. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, any other questions? Yeah. We've got one over here, Glenda. Hi, Glenda. Um, I'm a member of Red Hill Regenerators, oh, right. as well as being a volunteer for NCA. Um, I just wanted to advertise that on the top of Red Hill are uh, Mary and Marnie Griffin's original plantings of oh. Callistamans, which was part of her plan for the coloured coating of the hills. And they're being heritage listed, and they're um, over 100 years old, and it's still the original plants that she chose, and she actually chose the particular specimens that went in. And they're also, so Callistamans, Grevilleas, and some Sturtsteads have been oh, right. planted. 
So people can go up to up to the um, top of the hill, go to the where the cafe is, go to the left of that, and down below there, and one of the paths that go through, you go through the listeners. Oh, so well, thank you. Amazing. I didn't know that, and that's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's great to see what she was trying to do. In, in fact, one of the things I'd love is that if that could be digitised, those books. Um, I, there's a lot that is digitised in what's called the Nichols Collection. Um, Nichols used to work for Griffin. It was their family donated it to the, the library. But the, the, those books aren't. And I think if we could, we'd get a real... It'd be interesting. But I didn't know that. So it's nice to think that some of her work... And you can see her love of the red in that red um, uh, Tasmanian bark photo. Um, infusing her work. Anyway, thank you for that. Yes. Uh, well, we all love Marion's drawings, but is there any evidence she did any architectural designs for Canberra? Any buildings, roads, that sort of thing? Um, well, the, none of the Griffins in, in their ideas, none of their buildings were built. Um, so the, the layout was you know, the bones of it, but they didn't, there's nothing in their plan that was actually built. Um, so you can't say Mary did any architecture here. Um, but there is a debate about, you know, what was said between the two of them in, as they designed Canberra, but there, yeah, there are no actual buildings in Canberra that the Griffins did. Um, and they had this idea for the capital being this sort of um, stepped pyramid, which, which again wasn't built. So. There is no actual architecture in Canberra that the Griffins did. Um, in fact, he was pushed out in 1920 and um, they really didn't get going, evolving um, the building until the, the 20s. Parliament House was opened in 27. So, no. <laughs> but that's why I wanted to show some of those houses that she did on her own, give her a sense of her own architecture. But she, in fact, did very little um, independent architecture in Australia. Um, thank you very much, Glenda. I can probably add one thing to that. There may not be any buildings, but if you go up Mount Pleasant, the um, very plain grave of General Bridges was designed by Griffin, and it was to Mrs Bridges' specifications. She said he was a plain man, he wants a plain grave. She didn't want any horses or anything on it, and Walter followed those guidelines quite accurately. Um, I love the photo that you had, Glenda, of, of Robert Menzies um, inaugurating the lake. In fact, that happened in this building, just over here, when it was still a veranda. We've been closed in for quite some time, but yes, about where my friend Jody is standing in the gorgeous pink suit, that's about where Robert Menzies was standing when he declared the lake open. So we're in a great spot to... Um, celebrate both of them, especially Marion. Now, does anyone have any further questions for Glenda or for Claire? Or for me, you can ask. Or, or for Sally. <laughs> oh, don't, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, yes, there's a question right up the back. Um, I just wanted to mention regarding the Callistamon Plantation. Oh, yeah, yeah. That is actually maintained by a park care group called the Red Hill Regenerators. And they maintain, they maintain it to the extent that if any foreign trees or non callistamons start growing there, they get pulled out. And the integrity of that wow. plot is kept by a local land care, park care group. Amazing. Well, good, good luck. And I just actually want to point out, um, I'm on the board of the Griffin Society. Peter, Peter is from the, uh, running the local Griffin Society and he has, uh, well, he has um, this vision of having a Griffin Institute, which I think the National Capital Authority, in fact, itself suggested. Uh, so that's another idea of preserving perhaps some of the Griffin ideas, but um, that we have an institute or something that you can study more of what the Griffin's idea was and maybe broader their idealism, but the, the plants and the environment are, are a key of, of their thinking. So, um, given that it is Marion's birthday on Sunday, I will make a little ad for the National Carillion, which the NCA also looks after. You've probably seen some of our 
um, media that's gone out about a new bell 12 months ago, which has been christened the Nunnawal Bell, and about new clappers and all the work that's going on. So currently, our we like to call them our chime of Carillionists. I didn't know what a group of Carillionists was called, so I made it up. Um, our chime of Carillionists are practicing like crazy on the instrument, running it in like you would run in a motor in a car. But on Sunday, one of our best Carillionists, Thomas Lau, will be playing Ragtime and Chicago Blues <laughs> in honor of Marion. So that'll be 12.30 to 120. <laughs> Mention the oh yes oh okay so this one's my idea my idea but um, <laughs> from Marion's original drawings we're extrapolating some details and we're going to be putting them on stickers on Argumenzi's the circular walk around Central Basin so if you've always wondered why this building's here and it's not an aviary. Well, you can point out to someone that it was going to be an aviary. Um, so we'll have that on the sticker. We'll have the gymnasium and the um, uh, stadium that you mentioned and some of the other things around the lake. So your um, central basin walk just got a little bit more interesting. <laughs> now, as I said, it is Marion's birthday, so we do have a cake to cut. Now, because of COVID, we can't give you a slice, <laughs> but, but wait, there's more. We have individually boxed cupcakes for you to take home. <laughs> so, um, we just moved, get our, yes, yes. I'd like to, I'd like to stand with them. Yep. First of all, I'd like to thank all of the partners who helped put this together and the staff, and especially Peter, you've been a wonderful, the Walter Village Society has been a fantastic help. And your passion for Marion has not gone unnoticed. You're not gonna get wine, but <laughs> I'd need to acknowledge the way, the space you've left for all of us to make Marion the star for these next six months. So thank you very much. But what I'd like to do is thank Claire and Glenda, it's been fantastic. I can never, I learn so much every time I listen to both of these people. I go away and I keep thinking. I have shower thoughts and I come back to work. So everyone's gonna be terrified and hope I don't go near the shower for the next couple of days because it'll be like, what about we do that? And what about what they said? And how do we do that? But yes, yeah, so can you join me in thanking them for a fantastic talk tonight? And a very small token. And because of COVID, you can't share this either. So you have to take that with you. I think we're now going to move over. And while you can't eat the cake, you can watch our guests cut the cake. So, Ros, over to you. And to the live streamers, head back to your life. Keep pondering. Keep learning about Marion. Come to Canberra, see it for yourself. And have a great Marion year. Thank you.